Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another Wild Earth Africam live at the Waterhole. Um, and we started off at Tower Game Lodge up in Medikwe with some elephants. What a fantastic way to start. We finished yesterday with some elephants and we're starting today as well. What an absolute treat. Uh, I hope you are all safe and well wherever you are joining us from and you're having a fantastic day and I hope you're going to enjoy the next couple of hours um, of entertainment as we see what all of these fabulous water holes have uh, on offer. And don't forget, of course, that this is a live and interactive experience. Uh, you can watch us on our app, you can watch us on the website, and if you're doing so, don't forget to register. So you can send me any questions or comments, things you'd like to know about, anything you may be pondering. Uh, we would love to hear from you, and it makes my life a lot easier when we get lots of questions coming in. It makes my brain uh, go off in all sorts of weird and wonderful tangents, which is great to do. Um, and yeah, we've started out with some fabulous elephant activity at Tau. Tau Waterhole has been rather quiet over the last couple of days we've been doing this. So great to see some elephants. It looks like we've got a couple of young males who are just sizing one another up for now. Hopefully we'll get a little bit more pushing and shoving. Proper immovable, immovable objects in a uh, what's the phrase now? I can't think of it. Uh, uh, the force and objects meeting together and <laughs> colliding. Unstoppable force and an immovable object. There we go. But you can see the one on the right does look slightly bigger than the one on the left, and I think it's probably why he is winning. But this is by no means a full on uh, aggressive encounter. This is two young males just interacting with each other more than anything else. Uh, if you're ever lucky enough to see two elephants going at it properly, it really is uh, quite the the sight to behold, the power that, that is unleashed, the thuds, the clashing of tusks. Uh, it really is a, a monumental exchange. But this is very sedate, almost tender at times. And very important, of course, in elephant society, uh, young males will size each other up and this is uh, good practice in terms of when it comes to the real thing if uh, two males meet uh, in a breeding opportunity uh, normally the bigger male will easily dominate the smaller male to the point where generally speaking it doesn't really come to fisticuffs as it were um, elephants do respect their elders and a larger bull uh, will very easily see off a younger bull, he will submit and move away very quickly. But two equally matched bulls may have a fight, and that is uh, something pretty impressive to watch. But you can just see by the body language there's no true aggression here. It's just two boys having a little bit of a scuffle in the playground, if that. these sorts of activities, even just gentle play like this is so important. Uh, it gets the muscles working and uh, it's a very important sort of education for elephants for when it does come to the real thing. And hierarchy within an elephant society is very, very important uh, as these elephants will learn as they grow older and enter into the mating game. Difficult to put a, an actual age on these elephants. Uh, of course, elephants can live up into their late 50s, perhaps even into their mid 60s under the, the right conditions. Uh, and generally speaking, in the elephant world, you won't really get any mating rights until you're probably in your 30s, because they just keep getting bigger and bigger and more bulky. And as I said, normally the biggest males will be the ones that have the breeding opportunity. So you have to wait a little bit of time in elephant society to have your opportunity.
What a brilliant way to start the afternoon. one about trying to lock his legs but there's a definite not a huge amount but you can see the one on the left is a little bit bulkier um, and does seem to be winning the exchange certainly but look at that tenderness of that trunk and so this is a very amicable encounter you imagine these two probably grew up with each other they've probably been doing this for years Happy Sunday, canine girl, to you too. Nice to hear from you again. Thanks for getting in touch. <laughs> Looking forward to another great live at the waterhole with me. I hope so too. I hope so too. And this is a, a fantastic way to start. We'll see what else the afternoon has in store for us. Amazing the control that these animals actually have. There is so much power contained within that body, and yet you can see this is, as I say, a relatively tender exchange. It's just a little bit of. I don't even know the best way to describe it, but it's. Uh, it's a, it seems strange to use the word tender, uh, but it is just the way that little uh, the tactile explorations with the trunks there. Oh, but it seems that whatever that discussion was, looks like it may be over for now peanut gallery at the back, little zebra moving off. Probably time to come down to the water for a bit of a drink after that little bit of exertion. So here would say looking at the size of these shape from uh, my knowledge of it I would put these in their sort of late teens early 20s in terms of age but say very very hard to tell uh, one of the reasons that I would say that other than just size is the fact that uh, from this shot at least we're not seeing the rest of the breeding herd uh, and normally when elephants begin to come of age it's rather similar to that of uh, humans sort of by the time they start reaching their mid-teens they're becoming a little bit more independent um, and eventually, over a slow period, it's not a one day they pack their trunk, as it were, and uh, and leave, but they will start spending more and more time away from their natal herds. Um, and when they do leave, they normally form up and join these little uh, bachelor groups. So these two are going to have a go now. And what you'll often find in these sort of bachelor groups of males is that there will be one big dominant male within them, and these. Uh, more subordinate males are known as Ascaris, which comes from the Swahili word for guard. Um, give the idea that they're sort of not exactly protecting uh, the big male, but they're, they're learning from him. He is their role model. Um, and he also, from a biological perspective, does a great job of keeping their hormones in check. As I said before, when you have a big dominant male, the, the younger males respect that. And that just sort of suppresses the testosterone levels a little bit. Um, and allows them a little bit more control in their life. You imagine what happens if you get youngsters with a, a testosterone excess, they can get a little bit boisterous and you do often get some behavioural troubles. So having a big male uh, within the mix, it just keeps everybody in line. I thought about a bit of a drink that one, had a bit of a play in the mud, maybe feeling a little bit sorry for himself because uh, he did, I think, come off worse than that minor exchange that we saw. He's going to go and have some alone time, consider his strategy and technique for next time. Let's see what those other two are up to. So again, a little bit of a gentle push and a shove. Looks like that one's also been settled.
Lorraine, yeah, those two big boys certainly are enjoying themselves, having some great fun, all three of them now, in fact. I said, uh, well, I thought the, the, the slight aggressor that we saw to begin with looked like he'd uh, done what needed to be done, and the third one's decided to come in now as well. I think the third one was the instigator in this case, but say, quite normal, and uh, you could almost argue it's what we would call allolomimetic behaviour, which is sort of a knock-on effect if animals see other animals doing the same thing, they'll often mimic that behaviour, so evidently just some form of communication within the group, so just keeping those hierarchies in check. as if they've sort of moved off for now. Let's see what else we can find up here at Tau, if any of you have ever been up to Medikwe. It's a, a beautiful reserve, a little bit different from the low felt that um, I certainly am used to in the eastern side of Kruger. A little bit more arid, uh, a lot fewer large trees, very much sort of dominated by this acacia scrubland that you can see in the background. And here we have a beautiful spur-winged goose. We have an exciting announcement. Wild Earth is launching a YouTube membership program. For a nominal monthly fee, members get an ad-free channel, prioritized questions, early access to videos, and many more perks. You'll get fun features like badges and emojis that'll make you stand out in the chat. YouTube memberships will help us to continue with our mission of connecting people with nature, while giving you access to lots of our amazing content. And so it has been documented that spur wing geese do eat blister beetles from time to time and because of that you have to be a little bit careful if you were ever considering to eat a spur wing goose because if they have ingested a lot of blister beetles it can actually taint the meat uh, and give it an unpleasant taste and potentially even turn the meat toxic. So not that I've ever eaten a spur wing goose but uh, it is something to just be aware of that uh, you might get a, a nasty piece of spur wing goose if he's eaten too many blister beetles. Amazing thing, those blister beetles, though, we see a lot of them in summer. They feed on plants and they do sort of buzz around 
um, and you get some little influxes of them, they all hatch at the same time uh, and their larvae actually feed on grasshopper eggs, quite specifically some of the species that we have down in South Africa. So the parents often, or the, the female often lays the eggs close to an area where there is a good proportion of grasshoppers and those larvae when they hatch have to find grasshopper sort of egg casing um, and start feeding on it very very quickly otherwise they won't survive. So another interesting example of how so many things in nature are reliant upon each other um, for that species to pr proliferate. All part, part of the food chain and the food web. And that's why it's so important to have an excellent diversity in your ecosystem for it to be in good health. I always describe it as kind of like a scaffolding. Uh, the more diversity that you have, then the more aspects of it there are and if you were to lose one or two aspects of it it's not going to fall down you imagine if you have a a building sort of on uh, on stilts if two or three of those stilts disappear if there's 50 stilts to begin with that building is still secure but if your building only had four stilts to begin with and you lose two of them the likelihood it is that it's going to topple over so that's one of the reasons why it's so important to have a good diversity in an area and one of the dangers of too many introduced species that can take over, become encroaching species, um, or alien vegetation dominating an area. The upshot of that is that it reduces biodiversity um, and that compromises the structure of the entire ecosystem. Oh, I think we're gonna get a little, uh, it's everyone gonna get a little bit of a kick. Everybody seems to have a bit of feisty this morning would have feist. All right, well that was a lovely way to start. Some elephants and some zebras and a few little birds. So I think we're going to go over to Jabalani now and I believe we might have another member of the Big Five waiting for us. Let's go have a look. Ah, brilliant. So from the northwest over to the east into the Lofelt and Jabalani, so just outside Hoodsbrook, which is where I spend most of my time. And we have a nice bachelor group of Cape Buffalo, or Dugger Boys, as they're also known. This one actually looks like a female on the left. Yeah, so that's a female on the left and three males. Unusual to just see one female hanging out with the boys there. Whether there's more of the herd somewhere close by, I'm not sure. Normally you would find the females and the young and a lot of young males um, and more dominant males in big herds, numbering potentially up into the thousands. Um, but quite normal to find little groups of either solitary individual males or groups of four, five, six, seven, eight uh, older males hanging out together, usually close to water, become very water dependent, prefer the softer vegetation around water holes. So a little bit unusual to see one female with a group of males, possibly she was separated from the rest of the herd. Maybe they were harassed by some predators, some lions or something last night. Uh, and she got splintered off from the main group, that's a possibility. Maybe she particularly enjoys the company of these three boys, who knows? So anybody not aware, this term dugger boys will be something you'll hear quite often. If you look into safari or ever come onto safari, dugger comes from old African word meaning mud. 
due to the habit of these older male buffaloes, they do like to wallow around in the mud and splosh around, covering themselves, a little bit like we saw the elephant splashing mud on himself earlier. Um, and for the same reasons that most animals do it, for as a, as a natural sunblock, uh, and also to help with parasite loads and tick loads, a lot of scratching using the particles of that soil as an exfoliant, try and dislodge some of those pesky uh, ticks that attach onto the skin. And buffaloes are quite susceptible to ticks, thousands and thousands of ticks on a buffalo's body, which is why we often see, and you may be able to hear that in the background. In fact, one's just landed on the eye of that female, uh, an oxpecker. specializes in removing ticks from these animals. Yeah, it looks like we may have had a little bit of a feed issue there. So we've moved across to uh, Vic Falls Safari Lodge. Um, sorry, the, the buffalo froze. <laughs> uh, so we're back up to Vic Falls where we spent quite a lot of time yesterday enjoying the vultures and again these marabou storks. And I was actually, this reminds you, I was asked a very good question. Ken Hungar, I think it may have been you, about why um, the heads of these marabou storks, because they've got so little feathers on their heads, do they not ever get sunburnt? And generally sort of, you know, birds getting sunburnt as a discussion. And I threw a few ideas around because I really wasn't sure. Uh, one of the things I suggested was that there was a natural sort of um, skin oil or secretion that was formed and I actually did try and do a little bit of digging on that after we finished because I thought that was an excellent question. Um, it's quite difficult to get a, a succinct answer but what I did find out was very interesting. There is a substance which was first identified in algae uh, which of course is the, the green sort of plant-like substance you find on the top of water. There's a substance within them called gadiosol. Now, Gadgesol acts similar to the way melanin acts for people. It absorbs UVB rays, those harmful rays, and protects those organisms um, against damage from sunlight. Um, and it's thought that with animals eating algae, animals have also picked up that gene. And it was then discovered first in uh, zebrafish. I forget which year it was. I think not that long ago, and then maybe in the 70s or the 80s. Um, and they discovered that zebrafish were using this gadgesol uh, within their eggs to stop the eggs being damaged by UVB rays. Um, and since then, it's been discovered that almost all animals are able to produce this gadgesol substance with the exception of mammals. So we find it in amphibians, we find it in birds, we find it in fish, um, but not in mammals because mammals have hair to protect them from the sun. Now, there's no reason, theoretically, why mammals shouldn't have developed gadgesol. It's probably not a bad idea, because some of us, like myself, do struggle in the sun. But if you look back at the evolutionary history of mammals, uh, one of the reasons that is postulated as to why mammals don't produce gadgesol is when we tend to think of mammals as sort of dominating the terrestrial land of, uh, of the Earth. But don't forget, back in the early days, hundreds of millions of years ago, um, that was down to the dinosaurs, and they tended to eat small mammals. So back in those days, mammals were pretty much resigned to a subterranean existence to avoid the big scary dinosaurs, and did a lot of moving around. On the 30th of April, Wild Earth will be coming off the DSTV platform. We want you to come with us into a more sustainable future. How, you might ask? Well. YouTube is a brilliant way for you to enjoy the live drives. Come to our channel and you can enjoy the live drives for free. Alternatively, join our membership program and you'll get an assortment of other wonderful perks. We'll see you on YouTube.
or knock-on effects of predator-prey dynamics in relationships. So it would be a case of taking the law of averages into account. If you watch a lion hunt a hundred times and it's successful only 20 times, um, then you could suggest that it only has a sort of a 20% hit rate. Uh, of course, that will change within individuals. Certain individuals will be more um, skilled at taking out predators, perhaps due to their upbringing, what they have learnt. Um, you have to take in so many other factors, such as you know, what is the prey population? Um, is it an introduced species? Are they well adapted? Have they had a lot of experience being hunted by that particular predator? Um, are there any diseases? What are the habitat types? So there's an awful lot of variability, but ultimately for something like that, we have to take the averages. Uh, and a lot of these uh, organizations will all collate their information, often through various different universities, uh, and make that available for larger scale studies. Good Mango. Good afternoon to you. Are the feathers of most birds more or less the same texture? The feathers of some birds of prey look quite rough. Um, no, there are different, various different types of feathers that you can get. The most obvious difference between them would be those feathers sort of on the external part of the, uh, of the bird itself. So the flight feathers, the tail feathers, those are generally a lot more uh, sturdy, a lot more rigid because they have to deal with being out in the open um, and if you're going to use them for flight they have to cut through the air a little bit better and they, they can't deteriorate too quickly otherwise you may fall out of the sky which would be a little unfortunate if you're a bird. in any way, shape or form of flight. They are there purely as an insulation layer, uh, keeping the body warm, basically. So you get lots of different uh, categories of feathers, types of feathers that have evolved differently, depending on the role that they fulfill. Vulture feathers, particularly, we often do find vulture uh, flight threat, flight feathers, uh, and they are very very sturdy. That central vein can be well, maybe sort of you know five six millimeters across, making it very very rigid. Particularly in the larger birds, the heavier birds, uh, so a lot more wear and tear that can potentially be picked up in flight. The majority of these vultures are the hooded vultures. You can tell that from their size and that relatively small beak. And then one on the left, I'm assuming, is a white-backed vulture. You see a much stronger-looking bill. And then there's two marabou stalks. We saw one yesterday standing on that little island who wasn't too impressed when another one approached it. I wonder if it's the same individual, and that's very much uh, his spot. I say his, difficult to tell the difference between males and females. And it looks like there's possibly a spoonbill who just went behind a little bush and see if he pops out on the left. Are you a spoonbill? I think so, looking at your general shape. So we've got an ibis in the foreground and something following the spoonbill. I thought I saw him doing a bit of a um, stretching out his wings and creating a sort of cape. Uh, in which case that could be a black heron because that it does look like it from its sort of silhouettes there. And that's one of their amazing little hunting adaptations. They extend their wings and sort of wrap them in front of them, sort of like a, a Batman pose. Um, and that removes a lot of the glare 
from the sunlight and allows them to see what's uh, passing close to them under the water. I don't know of any other birds that do that. It's quite a unique behaviour to the black heron. Interesting to see if he does it again. It seems to be very much following this, what I think is a spoonbill, possibly a yellow-billed stork, not quite sure from here. The two seem to be either working in tandem or maybe the heron is benefiting from this other bird moving through the shallows and disturbing fish. No, it looks like a yellow-billed stork. Not a spoonbill, my apologies. The yellow bill kind of gives it away. Hmm. It's other birds very much following him around. I think it is a black heron and we do get to see him do that cloak manoeuvre. I've only ever seen black heron once, I think, up in Tanzania. I don't think I've ever seen one in South Africa. Yes, that's definitely an ibis entering there on the right hand side. That black and white coloration makes it a, a sacred ibis. Quite a common bird in uh, in South Africa and Southern Africa in general. You can see that long decurved beak just probing around in the mud. The one be behind on the far bank there, I think again difficult to tell from this view, but could well be a, a glossy ibis. Right, so we're going to head all the way up to Kenya now. We're doing our little safari across all of Africa. We started in South Africa, up to Vic Falls. Let's go up to Ogdonia in Kenya to see who might be joining us there. Wow, look at that. A beautiful lizard of some description. Now, I have to say, I've never visited Kenya, so I'm certainly not going to try and tell you exactly what this is. It looks like some sort of agama based uh, reptile, uh, but um, say my particular knowledge of specific Kenyan reptile species isn't great, but I'm guessing some form of uh, agama or something very similar. Looking at the shape and particularly the way it's, it's moving around there, you just saw a bird come flitting past I think and that's very much a defensive posture you see how he's raised up that orange head uh, expanded that throat pouch uh, showing off those bright colors just uh, moving in a in a particular way possibly just uh, warding off any potential danger <laughs> okay well he didn't hang around for very long decided that it wasn't the best place to be. But possibly it looks like a, maybe a superb starling hiding behind the branches there, looking at that coloration. That little sort of pile of wood there, almost like a, a crawl that's been made up there. Perfect place for that lizard to hide out. Uh, not unusual to see them out on an exposed perch like that, soaking up the sun. Of course, being ectothermic and, thermic and cold blooded, very much a requirement to warm up, and get the blood up to optimum temperature for activity. And it looks like a bit of a cloudy day. So, taking advantage of those 
minimal rays of sun filtering through. Again, not getting burnt, thanks to one assumes that gadgetal uh, substance or pigment within that skin. And that's just like a, an emerald spotted dove or the Kenyan equivalent thereof. That lizard didn't hang around for longer, hoping he'll put his head back out again at some point. we're going to start seeing less and less lizard activity, particularly down here uh, in the more southern reaches of Africa. As we move into the winter months, the days start getting shorter uh, and the uh, lizards will be able to pick up on that. They have a special organ uh, on their head called a pineal eye or a pineal gland. And one of the things that does is measure the length of daylight. Yes, it certainly do look very similar to the greater blue starlings, and that noise very similar, so I imagine very, very similar species. And the classic ring-necked dove, used to be the Cape turtle dove.
Just be coming down for a little bathe in the water. Spectacular coloration there. Look at that beautiful metallic y bluey blue sheen that these starlings have, even though it looks like a relatively overcast day in Kenya up there. Uh, we're still getting those incredible colours, and that's all done through the the layering of the keratin and little end pockets in between and the spectrum of light bouncing around in different directions. That's why it seems to have that sort of shimmery sheen to it. A lot of birds, of course, do exhibit um, that sort of iridescent coloration. And interestingly, I remember doing some little bit of research on this a while ago in terms of why they would do it other than visual communication. Take something like a starling, it's all oh, those blue-eared starlings, they're always that color, they don't change during the breeding seasons. Um, and you often find it in sort of flocking birds, birds that create large groups, uh, because oddly, it seems that actually iridescence like that see, increases the temperature of the body. Uh, so it's certainly not a mechanism for keeping cool, which I once thought that it could be, sort of reflecting some of the heat, but it has suggested that, oh, it's not the lizard, um, that iridescence actually absorbs a bit more heat. So it's thought now to perhaps be um, something to help the behavior of flocking birds, so that when one changes direction, it's very much apparent because of the changes of light and the feathers of your neighbours that enables the entire flock to move as one so they don't sort of bump into one another. Interesting way of looking at it. <laughs> Alert little lizard. The other interesting things about lizards from a defense mechanism is their ability to shed their tail in many species, not all species. Agamas cannot, for example, but skinks and geckos uh, are well known to lose their tails. Um, and that's in a behavior or a, uh, a response known as autotomy, sort of self-mutilation, where they can decide to jettison that body part and it will lie on the floor and flip-flop around um, and potentially distract a predator, allowing the animal itself to... Oh, got himself a little something there. Uh, the animal itself to get away. Uh, and what I found out recently as well, I got sort of lost in the rabbit hole of looking at animals and how they deal with things uh, over the last couple of days doing this, is there are some species of scorpion which can also cotomize. They can actually jettison their entire tail, including their stinger, um, very similarly to the way that skinks and geckos do. Um, however, sort of interestingly, the upshot of that is that because, I'm uh, going off down a random uh, rabbit hole here, but uh, the anus of the scorpion is situated quite high up on the tail. So when the tail is lost, so is the ability to excrete because it all seals itself off again. Now you would think that an animal that doesn't have that ability is going to have a bit of a constipation problem. Um, but tests have been done to suggest that uh, a scorpion's uh, equivalent of arthropod equivalent of kidneys, which are known as malpighian tubes, are particularly efficient and they don't defecate very much. Uh, and it can take up to eight months before there is you know, potentially a life-threatening problem. Ooh, careful, buddy. 
uh, a life-threatening problem. So you, again, you might wonder why has that not evolved out through natural selection, but it is deemed that because scorpions don't live for a huge amount of time, that potentially up to eight months is more than enough time to allow a given scorpion to breed and pass on the said genetics. Uh, and therefore it hasn't been sort of naturally selected out because the whole point is to be able to breed. conscious reaction to it uh, but I, I would be surprised if that was the case but never say never in the animal kingdom we are we are learning new things pretty much on a daily basis so we often don't give animals enough credit for choices that they make but say a lot of it is instinctual and has been passed down through generations and natural selection of what works works and what doesn't work doesn't get passed on because those animals don't make it and their genetic material is not passed on to the next generation. What is interesting is you often will find regional differences and different colorations from the same species that occupy different areas and again that's sort of testament to the fact that the animal is able to, or the animal's physiology, if I could put it that way, is able to um, react to its specific surroundings. Our lizard is back again. Looks actually quite similar to what we would call a, a common flat lizard down in southern Africa as well, with that coloration. And a bird of unknown origin, I'm afraid I'm not quite sure what that is. Large red beak looks sort of a mixture between a thick billed weaver and a red billed quelia, but I'm sure it isn't either. <laughs> That's a precarious vantage point. You can see those external sort of ear openings on the side there. delicate fingers.
in some reptile species you can actually see that pineal eye it's a little sort of pinprick hole on the top of the head uh, that is measuring the length of daylight and the intensity of, of sunlight which of course will reflect how high the sun up is in the sky remember in the summer months uh, the sun gets much higher than it does in the winter months when it's at its um, at its peak uh, but of course up in Kenya much closer to the equator there is a lot less variation in day length um, so it be interesting to see the difference in the reactions of animals up there because there isn't such a need to react to particularly changeable climates of course down in South Africa coming into autumn and winter now it can get surprisingly cool if any of you are considering going on a safari and going in the winter months which is a brilliant time to do it uh, be prepared to wrap up warm on an open safari vehicle on a cool winter's morning with the wind chill of uh, driving through the, uh, the fresh ambient air it is a lot colder than you think and I made that mistake when I first move moved over there uh, I remember one evening hiding on the floor pretty much tucked up into a ball because I was freezing because I was just in a t-shirt and as soon as the sun drops the air temperature just plummets down to very much single figures and add wind chill into that uh, and it makes for quite an uncomfortable and unexpected experience. Uh, Spencer, you're asking do agamas jump into the midair to catch prey? Um, honestly, Spencer, I don't know. Um, they can certainly move quickly enough and they would have powerful enough legs. Look at those back legs, they're almost like a grasshoppers. Uh, but they can certainly jump up in the air to evade predators. Um, I see no reason why they couldn't jump up to grab something that was flying past. Um, but I would think it might be a bit precarious to then land again on a branch like that. On the ground, perhaps, but I don't think they would necessarily do so from a branch from a safety perspective. Um, so yeah, not 100% sure on that one, Spencer, if I'm honest. Uh, I've never seen it, put it that way, but they are incredibly agile and they're certainly capable of, of jumping from an evasive tactic. So thanks everybody for the questions uh, and the comments so far. Do please keep them coming in. So what that was that landed there which did look a little bit lurey like which possibly is what's making that noise <laughs> they're raiding our zoomies <laughs> hiding behind a branch but yes, definitely looks like a lure of, of some description, or I should call it a Turaco now, I suppose. Uh, no, not a Turaco. Yes, Turaco. Some form of Turaco. Sorry, the old name for Turacos is, is Luris. What I first learnt when I came over here, still getting to grips with all these name changes. Certainly much greener up here at Adongo, as you would expect, so more tropical than the subtropical environment of South Africa, at least.
I'm just having a sneaky look to see if I can figure out what bird that might be. The closest I've got from a quick online check would be a white-bellied go-away taraco, which does occur in Kenya. It's very difficult to see. We can just see a crest, but it does have that very large crest. I did see a white chest. I'm interested to see whether there's a sort of a white bar running across the tail, which I think I possibly saw in flight. So I'm going to put that down as a white-bellied go-away bird or go-away taraco, which would make sense because it has a, a very similar voice to the one we get down in southern Africa. It is slightly more colourful. Times like this when I miss my big bird book which is back in South Africa at the moment, where I am currently not. I do not like not having my library, particularly when doing things like this. I mean, the internet is a wonderful thing, but you never know what you're going to find. And I'm old enough to still enjoy a good book, certainly. That's that little beautiful bird book of all the birds in the Sahara. Where I know this bird would be in there, as with the thing with the red bill. You have to take mental snapshots of them. Uh, and look them up at some point. It looks like there might be a sort of a shade of pinky red around the face feathers there and on the crest, which would make sense in the Tarakos, because if you think of the purple crested Tarakos particularly, um, and there are specific pigments that are only found in Tarakos, hence the name is covered in, which is the green pigment that we see in a lot of Tarakos in Southern Africa, and then Tarasin is the red pigment that, uh, if we take the purple crested Tarako as an example, so the Livingstons or the Nisner Tarako, when they fly, they have this most vivid, deep, almost sort of royal purpley red colour on the underwings, and that's not produced through the use of carotenoid pigments, which is how most birds get their reddish colour, their flamingos, for example, like that pinky red colour due to carotenoids and um, it's a very specific pigment found only within the Turaco family and is what actually gives them their name. Beautiful little long tailed something over there. And white cask on the top of his head. Looks like a seed eater by the shape of the bill. If you look at the shape of the bill, I wonder if that's not a male. And we saw the females earlier close to the water with a more speckled chest. They're similar to some of the widers uh, that we would see in southern Africa shaft tailed and the pin tailed widers. Ah, yes, you can see the male doing a bit of a display. That must be a female that's landed on the left. Um, so again, if it is a similar type of behaviour that we'd expect to see in what are called polygynous uh, birds, where one male tries to attract multiple females, they will have a particular displaying area, uh, which we would call a lek, 
Uh, whenever a female comes close, the male will display, show off. We saw him there doing his flapping. There we go. Yeah, very much showing off to the females. Um, and generally speaking, the one who does the best dance will have the best breeding opportunities. Hmm, they do not look like the ones we saw a little bit earlier, but definitely the females of this species. You can tell that from the way that the male is reacting. It certainly looks like some type of wider or, or similar species. But how cool is that? A pretty dance. The way he's taming his wing um, plane there whilst he's flapping. Awesome. Nice to see a little bit of behaviour like that. Again, a quick search whilst doing this. this is the nice thing. I can check things whilst we're watching. That is indeed a wider. It's known as a, a straw-tailed wider which would make sense. Um, Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, South Sudan, Tanzania and Uganda. So yeah, looking at the, the general shape of it, those long tail feathers and particularly that type of behaviour, I figured it was a type of wider. Look at straw-tailed wider. A couple of new birds for me today. Although I can't add them to my list, it doesn't count unfortunately seeing them on a camera feed. But good to know. It does say it occurs in Tanzania. So I did spend a year in uh, the very far south of Tanzania, but the majority of the bird life that we got there is very, very similar to that of southern Africa. But Aldonia being much further north, I found that there was kind of a band running across Kenya. Um, and either side of it, you've got a, a, a big difference uh, in the number of species that you found, or different types of species that you found. So a lot of Southern Tanzania around Sulu and Raha and Katavi, which is where I was, uh, the majority of those birds could be found in Southern Africa. Proudly SA, good afternoon. Thank you for your question there. So during a drought, is there a bit more competition between birds of prey? Um, theoretically, yes, there'll always be more competition if what is being competed over um, is less available. That being said, birds of prey are carnivorous and during a drought, that's actually when carnivores do very, very well because the herbivores on which they feed are struggling for food and therefore becoming weaker and slower and taking more risks. So you normally find with the more sort of classic predator populations uh, in terms of big cats and so on and so forth that their population numbers will increase um, during times of drought because all the herbivorous animals are struggling. They don't have access to those resources. So theoretically I would say if anything, there will be less competition during the drought, and, and, or maybe more competition uh, at the site of a deceased animal or at a carcass, because there's more opportunity. It'll be far more visible during a drought because there'll be less vegetation hiding it. So it may elicit more competition at a particular um, carcass or, or, or site where, where there is food available. Um, but in theory, say, Predators do well during drought conditions. It's the legs of a giraffe.
Oh, how time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> Wild Earth is turning 17 and we want to make the years count. 17 years of achievements, close encounters, and special memories. He's got it, he's got it, and he's straight up a tree. Come along as we reflect on our top 17 greatest moments. Here's to more years of connecting you to nature. Wild Earth, connecting with nature. I should say, licking their lips with their tongues. That's again just sort of in anticipation of the water to come. The same way we tend to salivate when we're thinking about food. Give that water. And start the rather ungainly process of reaching it. <laughs> Just lost her footing a little bit. Well, that's a classically archetypal African scene. You can see a flat topped acacia like an umbrella thorn in the background. And giraffe drinking against a, a very interesting sky. We've got different cloud layers that we can see there. We've got cumulus and stratus clouds and a few cirrostratus there. Makes for some nice depth. Thinking out loud, but going back to that question about competition among birds of prey during drought. Of course, in southern Africa, the drier months are the winter months, um, and in the summer months, there is a bit of an influx of migratory species, which does lead to more competition perhaps in the summer months. And you often find that a lot of the resident birds of prey in southern Africa, at least, 
do breed during the winter months, uh, possibly because there is better prey available, better food availability, as that's used food rather than prey, depending on the species, uh, and also because there is less competition, there is less numbers of birds being there because the migrants are elsewhere. Tandem giraffe thinking for a minute. This is speed. This one's going for a much more splayed approach. Just looks so awkward. Hey, Sasha, you've asked, when a giraffe gallops, does it use a three-step gait like a horse? Now, that sounds like a very official term coming from someone who is no doubt a bit of an equestrian. Um, I don't know exactly how to explain a three-step gait, uh, but what I can tell you is that a giraffe does not gallop like a horse, no. Um, giraffes have a very unusual form of locomotion. You can just see by the way they walk. They are one of the few animals that walks with both right legs in this case, and then both left legs at the same time. They don't alternate their legs like most quadrupedal animals do. And so that in itself is unusual, but when a giraffe gets up to full steam, which is can be very, very fast, we're talking a sort of 70 kilometers an hour, 50 miles an hour, can outrun a lion theoretically with those long legs. Um, they actually, they sort of, Display their front legs apart and then the two back legs come up and turn them in between them. So it's more like a, a high speed bound, I suppose. So it runs very, very differently and, and locomotes generally very, very differently to a sort of a classic hawk. Uh, so, so camels and also the, the hyenas uh, run in a similar, or certainly walk in a similar vein as well. So both left legs, both right legs. One of the eight reasons that the giraffe's Latin name is Giraffa camelopardus, which directly translates to camel horse, basically. You are far more likely to see it up here in East Africa, in the open grassy plains of East Africa. Down in Southern Africa, with our far more sort of bush felt environments, there are far fewer large open areas where a giraffe can sort of truly get up to full speed. Something I've, I've seen giraffes run, but I've, I've never seen a giraffe going absolutely flat out. The thing I've still never to this day seen a cheetah going full pelt. I've seen cheetahs running, chasing things, but um, without having access to those huge open areas where there isn't the danger of smashing headlong into a tree for the cheetah. Uh, I've never seen one going absolutely full out yet. It's one of those bucket list things. Thank you, Sasha. I hope that's answered your question to some extent. Beautiful scene. Giraffes drifting off from whence they came, they 
came in from that direction. You do get some nice surprises at these cameras because it's, uh, you're often sort of focusing on one area and suddenly you zoom out and oh, there's an elephant, oh, there's a giraffe. One of the things we often tell people on safari, people are so obsessed with taking photos uh, nowadays that they tend to forget to take in the entire scenario. Well, I suppose that has changed a little bit now. It's actually quite rare to see somebody bring a camera unless they're a, a proper photographer or a keen photographer. So many people just using their phones and tablets now uh, on drive to take videos and photographs. So what we used to find happen an awful lot is that people would be so intent of staring down the eyepiece of their camera that they would forget to look around them. It happened on more than one occasion, we've got somebody taking their 300th photograph of a sleeping lion and they don't see the lion that walks right past them next to the car because they're so intent on, on focusing down the viewfinder. It's always a good idea just to keep your wits around you. Anything can happen at any time out in the bush. And it's important to take it all in. There's only so much that a camera can record. It's an instant snapshot that our brains and our eyes can take in so much more and create indelible memories that will stay with us for the rest of our lives. You don't have to post everything on social media. Sometimes they could be kept deep within us. Okay, well that was a nice little flurry of activity up in Aldonia in Kenya. So we're going to head back to Tower Lodge down in Medikwe and see if there's any more activity at the water hole there. Okay, here we are back to town, scene of our little elephant rumble earlier. And we've got some lovely zebras making their way across. Very, very different landscape, as you can see, far more barren. A uh, different type of soil. You can see that whitish soil not supporting as much nutrients to allow things to grow. And of course, with this being a pumped water hole, uh, there's an awful lot more activity, making it harder for things to grow in this area. But a very, very popular spot for all mammals, great and small, to our water hole. Not just mammals often see crocodiles roaming the waters as well and a nice variety of bird life it's certainly a lot less lush and scrubby particularly this time of year you can see the uh, landscape in the back there very sort of rocky there's a big rocky ridge that runs close to the lodge up there and so characterized by a lot of these smaller different acacia species a lot fewer large trees very rare to see um, a leopard hoisting anything into a tree we get some shepherd's trees up there in uh, Medikwe that's about the biggest thing you're going to find so not quite the haven uh, that you get in the eastern side of South Africa in the low felt with those large trees along river lines particularly the jackalberries and the marulas that we often see leopards hoist their spoils into. Uh, a lot less pickings up in this part of the country. A nice little dazzle of zebra enjoying an afternoon drink. Looks like a male coming in at the back and being greeted. I say that just because of the behaviour that we saw, but also if you look at his stripes, they're just a little bit more contrasty, a little bit more black and white. Still has the shadow stripe, that little brown line uh, in between the black lines. But males are often just a little bit more striking in terms of their markings, a little bit more there's that sort of contrast between sort of blacker blacks and whiter whites. And this is likely his harem. So in zebra society you have one dominant male and then a group of three, four, five, six mares and his offspring. And he will 
viciously defend them against any other interloping males, but they don't hold a territory as such, they don't demarcate an area, they don't scent mark, um, so a male is territorial over his harem, his females and his young, uh, but not over a particular area. So when you do see those great big herds of zebras, uh, there will actually be lots of individual little, I suppose you could call them family groups, but lots of harems as one living together, and there'll be a, an understanding between the males to keep themselves to themselves, but there will of course also be competition between them, uh, and a male will always try and run off another male or steal one or two of his mares to join their own harem. Harsh, but good for genetic diversity. Almost feel he's sort of herding them off. So come on, it's enough. rather sinister shape of the crocodile lying in the shallows there. I was asked a, a good question a couple of days ago now uh, as to how well crocodiles can see underwater. I was explaining about the clear nictitating membrane which allows them to keep their eyes open underwater, acts like a pair of goggles. Um, again, I did try and do a little bit more reading up on sort of crocodile vision in general, and certainly yes, they can see underwater. Um, but not with any great level of acuity, not particularly sharp images, A, just because of uh, the water and the design of their eye, uh, but also because that nictitating membrane is just another barrier obstructing any light and any information from hitting the retina and to the optic nerve. So definitely can see underwater, but not to the same level that they can see on land, which by all accounts is nowhere near as um, acute as our vision is, for example. They can pick up movement and they can see the basics, uh, but they wouldn't be able to read the newspaper from 50 meters away. <laughs> Not that I could these days either.
There was a couple of other interesting things I did find out about crocodile eyes though, that I didn't know. Um, so one of them is to do with the shape of their fovea. So the fovea is sort of the uh, the part of the of the retina where the biggest concentration of uh, photoreceptive cells is contained. So we have a very, very small fovea and it's densely packed with those cells and gives us the ability to, to look around, focus on something and then really see a great amount of detail. Uh, if you look at a lot of animals that inhabit more sort of open habitats, uh, horses would be a good example and, and the zebras that we've just seen. If you actually have a sort of a good close-up view of, uh, of the eye of a horse, you can see there's like a horizontal uh, line moving across it or uh, that you can see in there that is the, the fovea so instead of having a pinprick type of fovea a lot of these animals have horizontal fovea's which gives them the ability to see more of the horizon and crocodiles also have that horizontal fovea because when they're scanning the shoreline for potential food um, they don't want to have to keep moving their heads around because that will give away their position as ambush hunters so they have the ability to sort of scan the entire shoreline without moving their head and staying completely motionless, which gives them a far better idea of what is actually around them. So that's a great technique uh, in terms of, of hunting and stealth. The other interesting thing I found out was to do with the actual receptor cells, cells themselves, um, and that there is a difference in the type of wavelength of light they are sensitive to between freshwater crocodiles and the saltwater crocodiles that you get out in Australia, for example. So you get different sort of shades of light that are more prominent. If you've got something down there, what are you doing? In the oceans, you generally get things shifted more towards the blue end of the spectrum, and in freshwater, more towards the red end of the spectrum because it's murkier water, it's, it's shallower uh, and sort of darker colors. Um, and the acuity of those the, uh, the cone cells within a crocodile's eyes differ between uh, those two groups of crocodiles based on their habitat. So ocean dwelling or saltwater crocodiles are more sensitive to the blue end of the spectrum and freshwater more to the red end of the spectrum. So another nice example of nature having adapted and developed based on its surroundings. I'm quite sure what this crocodile is up to here. I don't think he's caught anything because he hasn't really moved. What it could be doing is something called lithophagia uh, where they eat and swallow little stones. Maybe he's got a little rock or a stone down there. Oh, oh no, he has got something. Like a barbel or something he's caught. A barbel or a catfish. Doesn't seem in a particular hurry to eat it. Ah, Jordan's in my ear. Jordan said it, she thought it looked like a snake. Possible, you do get pythons. I've seen puff adders swimming. It definitely had something. I thought maybe he'd be swallowing, swallowing rocks and just dislodging rocks to swallow. That just helps with neutral buoyancy um, so that they can be suspended in water. But definitely had something within his jaws there. Let's hope he lifts his head out of the water again. Come on, maybe. It looked quite long and thin, so I thought some sort of barbel, but a snake is possible. Oh, wow. That is a snake. It must be a snake. How amazing is that, everybody? That asks me what snake that is. It doesn't look like a python. I don't see any markings on it. Mumbas also swim. You never know what you're going to see, hey? How about that? A crocodile with a snake kill. That's pretty epic. Reptile on reptile. Yeah, definitely a snake of some sort. Quite a pale belly. Spitting cobra, snouted cobra. It's a good sized snake, whatever it is.
wow, look at that. Well, that's something I've never seen. I've seen snakes in water. I've seen snakes snakes swimming. I've seen crocodiles catching fish, catching antelope, but I've never seen a crocodile with a snake. Joanne Mello says that you like crocs and you're glad to see them on the show. Well, so are we, Joanne, and this is an absolute treat for all of us. I just saw the head there on the left when he lifted his head up. It did look like it had a sort of a flattened head. I reckon that's a cobra. It looks something like a snouted cobra, perhaps, or a, or a big infezi, a big spitting cobra. Strange, it doesn't seem to be sort of that fussed and swallowing up and swallowing it quickly, very much savouring it, giving it a good chew, then having a rest. I suppose the snake's not going anywhere at this stage, but uh, I would kind of expect it to just to be chomp, chomp, swallow. But maybe this is not something that the crocodile gets to experience very often either, and it's very much savouring the taste. How amazing. Because the I think that's still the head is there in the water. Maybe if he does start to swallow it down, we might get a glimpse. I thought I saw a flattened hood, like one of the elapids, one of the cobras. I wonder if the snake wasn't already deceased and in the water, because we saw the crocodile just sort of come drifting in. And normally, the snakes, when they do swim in the water, are slithering across. Oh, there goes the head didn't get a good enough look, um, are, are, are slithering across the surface and I'm pretty sure we would have seen the crocodile snap down on it. So I wonder if it had deceased and was on the bottom the crocodile just happened to, to come across it. Well, I guess we'll never know now. And there will certainly be no evidence when it comes out the other side. It's just this sort of green slimy um, excrement for want of a better word that they that they produce scat i suppose being a, a, a carnivore uh, and that usually calcifies in the sun and just goes white it's almost like a sort of a greenish white solid cow pat there'll be no evidence of anything left uh, that you'd be able to ascertain what that was such as the digestive juice strength of a crocodile Rafiki21, you wanted to know about what unique hunting strategies crocodile use to catch their prey. Well, they are the ultimate stealth hunter. They've got the patience of Job. Uh, they will lie in the shallows waiting for something to come down to the water's edge for huge amounts of time. And they have different hunting strategies, but they very rarely will sort of chase after anything and take it out unless it's a, uh, something like the, the you know, animal crossing a river that is much much easier to catch. Um, what they do do is have an incredible intelligence and an ability to learn the behavioural patterns of animals. So, um, and this happens with people as well. It doesn't take very long for a crocodile to learn that an animal or people or whatever it is may come down to exactly the same part of the river uh, and get into the water or close to the water. The first time it happens they'll probably get a bit of a fright and move away. The second time it happens in the same place, it's almost as if the penny drops and there's a little light bulb that goes zzz, zzz, above their head and they go, hang on a minute, I've seen this before, I'm going to commit this to memory. And by about the third time, the crocodile will be waiting for you, will have anticipated um, that activity. So we, that's been well documented that they have the ability to learn the best places to hunt. Um, I've also seen sort of footage of crocodiles lying in a pool underneath some rapids and just lying uh, with their mouth open facing upstream um, so that any fish or any other things that are caught in those rapids get washed down and uh, the jaw of a crocodile is so sensitive uh, that one the slightest touch and those jaws will snap shut with a huge amount of force trapping whatever it is within there so that's something also that you 
that you sometimes see is crocodiles lying with their mouth open facing upstream in a strong current. I can't think of anything else off the top of my head, but those are very much what I would associate with a croc, but say the, the ultimate ambush hunter. What an amazing sighting that was. We have an exciting announcement. Wild Earth is launching a YouTube membership program. For a nominal monthly fee, members get an ad-free channel, prioritized questions, early access to videos, and many more perks. You'll get fun features like badges and emojis that'll make you stand out in the chat. YouTube memberships will help us to continue with our mission of connecting people with nature while giving you access to lots of our amazing content. So sorry, hey forty. That was a that was a quite sort of brief uh, answer, but I hope that gave you what you needed to know. I uh, sorry, I also missed a question earlier, which I'm very apologetic to Sandy for. Um, she was we. This is, came through when we were talking about the zebras before we got distracted with our crocodile snake um, <laughs> interaction we saw there. Sandy was asking if I've ever seen an albino or an albino zebra. Uh, we sort of discussed those yesterday. Um, no, I haven't. I've seen some zebras with some sort of fairly unusual markings and splotches on, as opposed to sort of neat stripes, but never a, a fully albino zebra or even a leucistic zebra. Uh, I think so. The problem is with their, uh, generally speaking, they're sort of out in the open, going to have great difficulty with thermoregulation and be very, very obvious uh, to any predators. So chances are they don't survive for very long. Uh, even the leucistic ones, let alone an albino zebra. A little and large going on at the moment, our spurwing goose on the right and the little blacksmith's lapwing on the left. Big brother going on.
Uh, going back to the, the question on mating and reproduction, there is a species of crocodile, uh, I believe, that can actually reproduce by what's called parthenogenesis, uh, which is the development of, a, uh, of an embryo without the requirement of fertilization. Um, I don't know much about it in crocodiles, I would think that's highly unusual. You normally see parthenogenesis more in um, insects, aphids for example are well known um, to do it, I think some, certain species of wasp as well. Um, so yeah, rather unusual to find such a large animal involving in uh, parthenogenesis. I still can't get over that snake. I'm still racking my brains to try and think if I saw anything distinctive on that snake or what snakes would be most prevalent up in the dickways to think uh, what that would be. Uh, but I, I'm pretty sure I saw a flattened hood, so I'm going to go with something from the cobra family or similar. But it was just very odd that we never saw any strike by the crocodile. I did see him when we just were beginning. did look at him. He was sort of mouthing something in the water. Uh, but I wasn't sure what he was doing. And so I've got a funny feeling that that snake may have been just dead already in the water and had sunk to the bottom and maybe the, the crocodile hadn't to come across it. Because uh, snakes generally don't go under the water too much. Pythons certainly can do, but I've, I've never experienced or seen or heard of cobras sort of swimming underwater like sea snakes do. But maybe they do. I'm not sure be my next research project. A head movement going on from these zebras as they're approaching the water there. Uh, often zebras do bob their heads when they walk just to give them a better view with their eyes being on the side of their head they can't see as clearly directly in front of them so they do sort of sway their heads a little bit when they walk but I've noticed with this group and the previous group we're watching more of an exaggerated motion of that. I'm just speculating here but wonder whether perhaps coming down to water they're feeling a little bit more vulnerable uh, and making sure they get a really good look at the surroundings. Maybe there's a little sound that's bothering them, or maybe it's some form of social interaction. Spending a lot of time with noses down as well, possibly getting some nutrients from the soil. It's a fun part about watching nature, is trying to figure out why things are doing what they're doing, because they're generally always doing it for a reason. See, that, that sort of movement is because it flies, I'm sure, a lot of uh, insects around. It's disturbing them. But whether there's just also a sort of an air of, I suppose you could say, excitement that they might be getting a drink soon, but just making sure, always sort of keeping the emotions in check while they make sure it's all safe. On the 30th of April, Wild Earth will be coming off the DSTV platform. We want you to come with us into a more sustainable future. How, you might ask? Well, YouTube is a brilliant way for you to enjoy the live drives. Come to our channel and you can enjoy the live drives for free.
Alternatively, join our membership program and you'll get an assortment of other wonderful perks. We'll see you on YouTube. holding the mane upright and the mane will start to sag to one side. So it's one of the ways that you can look at a condition of a zebra because it will always still look quite chunky just because of the digestive system. So the mane is a good giveaway for health. Rafiki21, you're asking how do zebras communicate with each other? Well you can see there's a lot of tactile communication. We often see them resting their heads on each other. Um, and we hear a lot of vocalizations between zebras as well. So that classic that you hear from zebras, often uh, sort of a warning call, and there'll be a lot of scent as well. Remember, every animal has its own unique scent signature. So a lot of olfactory communication. So all sorts of ways, really, and they have very good eyesight. So had a suggestion and a very good one for that matter from and you'll have to forgive me if I'm producing this uh, pronouncing this incorrectly is Maistai Kunicorn or, or Patty um, suggesting that maybe that snake met its demise when an elephant accidentally stepped on it when an elephant went into water um, to, to have a drink or to feed on something in there that's not a bad shout uh, that's certainly a possibility uh, I remember we saw on Africam a little while ago one of the most traumatic things I've seen in my life actually. We were watching little, uh, some footage of little tiny, tiny baby lapwings. They can't be more than about an inch or so high. And they were running around on the shore and a great big elephant came down to have a drink um, and trod on one. And there was just one minute we were watching a lapwing and then there was a big elephant foot in its place. <laughs> it was rather traumatic. I uh, didn't really quite know what to say about that one. Um, so that's certainly a possibility. Maybe there was a snake in the water that got trampled by an elephant. Who knows? Maybe a bird had caught it, an eagle, 
something like a marshal, it was a big snake, so it had to be a strong eagle and was flying over and maybe it was a bit too heavy and it happened to drop it in the water. Uh, all of these things we can only speculate on. But uh, I'm just very glad we saw it. It's one of the most unusual things I've seen for a long time. But we are running low on time now. It looks like we've only got about five minutes to go. Today's gone very quickly. We've had some lovely sightings. Giraffe drinking. We've had elephants jostling. We've had some interesting zebras. Obviously the, the crocodile was probably the most exciting, um, unusual thing that we've seen. Some lovely bird life up in Kenya and at Vic Falls. Um, but as always, if you've got anything uh, that you would really like to highlight as a highlight, we'd love to hear your thoughts on today's proceedings. And very excited now to see what we might see tomorrow. That's the beauty of doing this. Some days are quiet, other days you see something highly unusual. Well, I think this one have a little rub. So going back to the communication thing, what you often find with the youngsters is because the mother will go off into uh, the long grass when it's time to have her foal and spend a bit of quality one-on-one -on -one time with her new arrival. And during that time, the baby will very much learn the scent of his or her mother, uh, but also learn the unique strike pattern. Remember, every strike pattern is different, just like a fingerprint, and a baby apparently is able to recognize or key off the pattern of the mother, particularly around the shoulder. You see at the top of the front leg there, you get that sort of interesting triangular shaped pattern. That's about eye height for the baby zebra, and that apparently is, is an area of the mother that they will have a very good knowledge of and potentially be able to recognize. But more often than not, individual recognition will come down to the smell. Bianca, you're saying the crocodile was definitely your favorite. I think it has to too. I mean, it's a clear winner. Uh, but we've seen some really lovely things. I particularly also enjoyed that uh, shot of the giraffe, thanks to our zoomies for that one, with the with the sky behind them. That was a very uh, sort of regal and magnificent pose. The two giraffe drinking in tandem. Uh, the elephant right at the beginning had a little bit of a, a little bit of a very gentle push and a shove that was exciting to watch. Um, our little lizards that we saw up in Kenya. We've seen lots of amazing stuff today. I cannot wait to get back into the bush. It's been too long, and this is really wetting my appetite. Remember, a lot of the scent from these animals is contained in urine and the droppings. Uh, you'll often see males from many species sniffing the ground around where a female has urinated, getting all that species specific, specific information. Uh, but when they do, you'll know they're doing it because they'll call that funny face where they sort of draw the gums back, expose the teeth in what we call a phlegm grimace. And by doing that, that opens that special organ, vomer nasal organ or organ of Jacobson in the roof of the mouth. Um, and by sort of pulling the lips back, it opens that little uh, orifice there, and those scent particles take a slightly different route towards the brain um, and go through the appropriate um, I don't know, software to decode that information. You'll see that in macaques, you see that in rhinos, you see that in antelopes and zebras. Elephants, you won't see it. You can't see an elephant phlegm and grimace, but you will see an elephant touching its trunk on urine or breathing in, sucking in the air from the urine into the trunk and then placing the trunk into the mouth and either so touching it with those lips if he's managed to get some of the urine onto the lips or blowing the air directly into that organ. He's getting all that species specific information. That's very important. They don't have the right software to decode another species information. Yes, they can. They might know it's from an impala, but they wouldn't be able to tell that it's Fred, who was in a good mood and here yesterday. 
Uh, but we're almost out of time into the last minute thanks everybody for joining us today it's been a, a really spectacular afternoon at the waterholes thanks to everybody in Johannesburg to Jordan and to Dewa and the rest of the team and of course for you guys for making it so special I will be back again tomorrow uh, between 12 and 2 Central Africa time sorry 1 and 3 Central Africa time uh, with another two hours of excitement and I very much hope that you'll be joining us don't forget to join the live safari this afternoon with the rest of the teams in Juma and Amakala. And whatever you're up to today, I hope it goes wonderfully and we've given you some great memories.